The sermon title this morning is When Mothers Rule, or When a Mother Rules. Some of us are celebrating Mother's Day today, and some are not. Some of us will have wonderful experiences of dinners and gifts and expressions of gratitude. Some of us are remembering mothers who are now gone. And some of us are remembering mothers who were never there for us. It is true that some of the women among us love being mothers, but others are more ambivalent about the experience. It is also true that mothers do not have to be female, but that men also can mother, especially in the way I'll define it today. Celebrating mothers today is a secular holiday, and unfortunately, it does overlap with Christianity in a way that's particularly not helpful. It's not good for women. So before we get to any good news today, I have to go through and slog through some of that cultural and religious baggage about women as mothers. I do promise you that we're going to get to some good news by the time I finish, but just hang in there with me first. Part of this Mother's Day sermon has been really difficult because of the kind of work that I am, I am reading right now. I'm reading lots of books. You may wonder after you hear why I'm doing this, but this is important for, for the work that I do. The first one was called The Sexual Lives of Ancient Rome. And that helped me to see that women were simply appendages to men in ancient Rome of little value except as baby makers. And this was in the time before Christ. Later, however, that same thinking in the Greco-Roman world was met up with the church fathers, the Christian church fathers. And so when you combine those two things, what happened is that women became dangerous because of their sexual allure. And women were impediments to men's spiritual lives. So the way to keep yourself safe was to keep women virginal if possible. Then I read a book called The Subordinate Sex, a History of Attitudes Toward Women Down Through the Ages and Through Various Societies. And once again, I discovered there's no good news here either. And in the, in the Greek world that preceded the Romans, the Greek women had it even worse because not only were they valued as baby makers, and that was the only value they had, but they were kept secluded and they couldn't even be out in the public sphere in any way. But the authors of this book quotes, Christianity was a male-centered, sex-negative religion with strong misogynistic tendencies. The very fact that it was male-centered and suspicious of sex led it to a suspicious attitude toward women as any kind of sexual creature. These ideas of the early Christian fathers about the evilness of sex and the dangers of women were carried over into the mainstream of Western thought." End of quote. And if a woman happened to be intelligent and rational, then they simply said she had a masculine mind. It had nothing to do with being female. So, now here we have set aside by the culture a day to celebrate women as baby makers, mothers. So, chocolate, flowers, and Hallmark cards notwithstanding, how can we name the truth of the ways women's lives in general and mothers' lives in particular are still problematic in our culture? We have to ask ourselves, what exactly we are honoring in an overcrowded planet of 7.125 billion people with growing inequality in our own country, with a growing lack of food resources, primarily because of climate change, so that we can't even feed all of these people. Why are we celebrating procreation? Is that good news? In the U.S., we have the highest infant mortality rate of all industrialized countries on the planet. Do we really care about mothers? Women are still working for less money than men. Is that to punish them for not staying at home? We do not have equal rights or protection under the law, nor do we have completely con con complete control of our own reproduction. 
Sweden, on the other hand, encourages men and women to take extensive um, paternity and maternity leave. We don't have the social structures that like subsidized childcare or remuneration for the ways women's domestic work actually contributes to the GDP in this country. And women still do the bulk of childcare and household maintenance, even if she has a job outside the home. Then there's also the problem that the women who do not have children, either by choice or circumstance, are looked at a little bit askance about that. And in addition, if marriage is delayed or not chosen, then we assume that motherhood is not a possibility. So are we really celebrating marriage here? Because Jesus didn't do that. That's not part of the spiritual life at all, especially in his day when it was polygamy, if you had enough money to feed numerous wives and children. And then I'm exploring a little bit deeper here that maybe we just feel a little bit guilty because we, we, know, we know we were hard to raise. No. It's hard work being a mother, and we feel guilty about that. Or perhaps it's even worse. Half of the children born today are not planned. And a lot of women... Um, are not capable, actually, without the skills. So there's a lot to complicate our feelings about mothers today. And in the cold light of reality, not every woman wants to be a mother, and so forth. Some of us would rather just go to a des desert island some days when you have a really bad day, you know? Just leave me alone, no family. So what I've gone through very briefly here is a history of some of the Western misogyny that preceded Christ, what was... Um, and then, all, but also we got into the Christian church later on. I've talked about the invisibility of women's problems and concerns that the other 364 days of the year. The problem of limiting a woman to just baby making capacity and that even gender doesn't determine what mothers. So now let's turn to see if the gospel can help us out with any of this. <clears throat> One would hope that Jesus would be helpful here. He did have a mother, after all, though Protestants are less inclined to put her on a pedestal, as our Roman uh, Christian friends would do. Actually, Jesus is no help on this one. First, to be perfectly clear, he did take care of his mother on the cross, remember? He, so responsibility toward mother, care for mother, I'm not having a problem with that. Okay, but remember he said, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Whoever does the will of God. And then there's another story that I did not include. This is a time when a woman in the crowd was all excited about Jesus. And so she burst forth. This is in Luke 27. And she says, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Seems like Jesus didn't celebrate Mother's Day either. But it wasn't because he had a problem with mothers. He had a problem with cultural rules that kept people in boxes. And particularly those boxes that dehumanized or trivialized their existence. For example, if you had a skin condition, you were labeled a leper. And you were sent outside the city to live the rest of your life. Jesus violated that rule and taught and healed and lived among them. And if you were in anyone who was impure, and that was anybody who was a non-Jew, including the women or the tax collectors or what you did, there are lots of other ways, you were impure, so you were boxed in to that. And yet Jesus violated that box. He ate freely with them, talked with them, healed them, okay? So Jesus was not going to glorify women simply for being mothers. He would not allow the woman in the crowd to get by with that because he had a more grand vision than that. He wanted to completely redefine family. As one theologian commented, Jesus was not pro-family. He was pro-children. It was clear he was not pro-mother either. He was pro-women, and he was pro-person. For Jesus, it was not about bloodlines or gender. It was about living and loving. It was about having a common spiritual vision of God, living in love beyond the cultural rules. 
Christians have new visions and dream new dreams. It's about a different way of being in the world. So, the culture can do its hallmark cards. What do Christians do? Using Jesus' words as a guide, we dare not get stuck in the bloodlines, but instead should honor all those who mother us. Jesus said all the rules, all the cultural rules slash religious rules can be summarized as love. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So it's really simple. Anything less than love is culture. Or if it isn't about love, it's about culture. But we have a vision that transcends culture. We have a dream that love rules. Love lasts, love abides, for we have a God who is love. A God who loves us as a mother. Now, in case you didn't know that, I'm just going to read you some of these scriptures in your Bible. In Hosea, God says, It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, I who took him in my arms. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. And in the 13th chapter, Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and tear them asunder. Motherhood images, according to Hosea. In Deuteronomy, God gives birth. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you. You forget the God who gave you birth. Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And then today's scripture, can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Yes, even if that were possible, I will not forget you. And then God as a woman in labor, for a long time I have held my peace, Isaiah says. I have kept myself still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. The psalmist says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. And of course, Jesus says, O oh, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. God as a mother who sees us, hears us, calls us by name. This love that will not let us go. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Have you ever prayed to a divine feminine before? I will suggest that you might want to try this because strange things happen. I did one time. I was mad at God. I was mad at God because he was not doing what I wanted. I'd been single for eight years. I was tired of being single. I was doing all the things I should be doing. I was going to therapy. I knew what kind of partner I wanted in my life. And no partner was showing up. And then after, I, after a while, I realized I was battling with God like I battled with my father, an authoritarian judge who was withholding favors from his daughter. And I said to myself, Beverly, you don't think that way. Okay, let me try to think, if God is feminine, what would happen? I hadn't got that thought out of my brain yet, and I immediately had an answer from her. <laughs> it, was, it was the strangest thing. i have been struggling for months about this, angry, and this statement simply took all of that away. And she said to me, Beverly, it's not time yet. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what? My anger was gone. I had been heard. 
Oh, okay, I'm not in charge of this. She is. You might want to try. Think of those images of God as like, hopefully, your own mother held you in your infancy and nurtured you and loved you, hopefully obsessively and abundantly. The spirit of love and compassion that we might want to name mother always puts love before the rules. It does away with the gendered and the cultural boxes. It always puts the care of others before the way things are supposed to be. The Christian story is that God refused to stay apart from humanity, but came and lived among us in our bodies, in our flesh, to show us how to love one another, how to be love touching, healing, moving through the cultural rules and violating those that keep us apart, that keep us hungry or lonely or lost. Love always moves towards us, eagerly welcoming us home. With all of our flaws and our bad choices, and love waits for us. Love is kind and understands our predicaments. This is how a Catholic nun, Miriam Therese Winters, describes it. Mother and God, to you we sing. Wide is your womb, warm is your wing. In you we live, move and are fed, sweet flowing. ourselves and one another. It is not about procreation or gender. It is about the nurturing power of enduring, abounding, astonishing, excessive love. And that is what the people of God celebrate. Amen. Amen. Amen.